Hello, everyone, um, and thank you for coming to uh, my talk today at uh, Open Source Summit North America. Uh, my name is Brian Bellendorf. I'm executive director of Hyperledger, uh, which is an initiative hosted within the Linux Foundation. Um, uh, some of you may know uh, more about Hyperledger. I'll do a little bit of kind of about our background, but I really wanted to uh, spend today talking about the application of blockchain technology, really what we're doing at Hyperledger, to uh, the field of digital identity. Um, and and I, I, you know, using it as a way to reinvent how digital identity works uh, today uh, on the internet, um, and really the progress that this community has made in moving forward with it. Um, I, I'll speak for about 30 minutes and then open it up for about 20 minutes of Q&A uh, at the end. Um, I feel free to start asking questions and dropping them into uh, the, the, the Q&A box, uh, and I will work through those uh, when I get to the end. Um, also, we have an Ask the Expert session with Dave Hughesby, who is the security maven at Hyperledger, starting immediately after the end of this talk, so at uh, 1 15 p.m. Central Time, uh, uh, and that's in the Ask the Expert B channel uh, over on Slack. So um, between this talk and, and, and your conversation with Dave, hopefully a lot of your questions will be answered, but this is a really rich space, and I'm really excited to be talking with you about this today. So just a bit of a brief backgrounder on Hyperledger. We are an open source project, uh, again, hosted at the Linux Foundation. Uh, we're a global consortium that's been running for about four years now, building underlying technologies uh, to for distributed ledgers uh, to support use cases in finance, in supply chains, uh, in uh, uh, all sorts of, of interesting applications, <clears throat> and in particular in digital technology. I, 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 every Hyperledger project actually works the same way as the Linux Foundation uh, projects do, where we bring together, you know, kind of the, the, some tooling around a, a common license, a common IP framework, uh, collaboration tools, you know, Jira, chat, GitHub, those sorts of things. Um, but also add to it uh, a bunch, uh, some process around marketing and, and getting the word out there about how we're building, what we're building, uh, as well as uh, security audits uh, and other best practices for managing open source communities at scale. Um, there's obviously the real meat of what gets created comes from the developer community. Uh, we're not paying for development directly. It all comes from the people who show up to the project and decide what to build. And it's incredibly rich as an ecosystem because of that. Uh, and then at the Linux Foundation, uh, we have a staff uh, assigned to helping grow both the technical side of the community and the commercial side as well. Um, so there's quite a few companies now uh, offering hosted services and shrink wrap product and other types of um, commercial activities around Hyperledger projects. So it's really an exciting place to be. Um, we are an umbrella project, like many at the Linux Foundation. We are home to a number of different, uh, what we call ledgers. Uh, uh, these are really like databases, right? But fanned out, distributed over multiple nodes and um, uh, lots of different models for how to do this. Uh, you could think of uh, those ledgers as being as different from each other as say MySQL is from MongoDB. Uh, there are a few of these actually very focused on digital identity. Um, and those are where I'll be focusing the time today. Um, those are Hyperledger Indy, Ares, and Ursa. Um, but if you have an interest in decentralized technologies and in, in trying to bring trust really to uh, uh, to to this world, um, and because of the tooling used, not just trust in a in an individual or an organization um, uh, or or an institution, but actually trust in technology and processes. Uh, these are technologies you really want to get to understand and, and learn about. So feel free to to, to check them out at hyperledger.org. Um, but let me start a bit with backing up and, and trying to talk just abstractly about what what is identity. Um, and I mean, we we that term is such a loaded term, uh, uh, especially in 2020. Uh, um, and I, I don't mean to define this in a rigorously philosophical way. Um, I'd really like to try to define it in a in a matter that is applicable to the digital world that we're in today. But to first, let's just try to understand how identity works um, in the in in most cases in the physical world. Uh, and when I'm thinking of uh, identity, I'm thinking of things that you do as the holder of, of identity documents uh, to prove things about yourself, right? You're not you're not defined by your driver's license or social security number, but those documents, your driver's license and and the social security card um, and your diploma uh, and other other credentials, they form an essential part of of 
who you are and what you can do in this world, right? Um, uh, and uh, we have, I think, an interest in making sure that that the digital world kind of um, brings along um, some of the advantages of, of, of identity as it works in the physical world, but also trying to do better than that and deal with uh, perhaps some complications that arise from that in the real world. Um, but let's look at this in the real world today. You have issuers of credentials, you know, the, the the state DMV, for example, for your driver's license. You have holders of those credentials, you. Um, you have this driver's license. And then you, there's a verifier. Like, let's say you go to a bar and you need to shoot, prove that you're 21 years of age. You're presenting that that credential to a verifier, right? Um, and, and what's interesting here is the verifier has to have some trust relationship with the issuer. You know, the bar has to have a trust relationship that, you know, they, the, the Department of Motor Vehicles is not going to issue a credential to me unless I'm actually of the appropriate age, unless the you know it has the date of birth on it, you know, and and the issue the verifier trusts that the issuer has has done that due diligence. Um, but in the real world, the issuer doesn't know where I present those credentials, right? Um, uh, the issuer uh, uh, can't automatically cause that driver's license to disappear out of my wallet and pretend that it never existed, right? Um, now, I might lose my driver's license by, say, getting too many drunk driving arrests or something like that, um, but I, 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 that that's not a document that just can be disappeared or, or forgotten about, uh, and that's really important to, to how I think digital identity works in the real world. Um, in the digital world, we kind of want it to work the same way. But sadly, right now, your your equivalent of your identity documents typically sit on the other end of a name and password at a portal somewhere, right? Um, it's your Google account, it's your Facebook account, it's you know log in with Twitter and share your social graphs from all of these different networks. But those credentials could disappear at any time. They could be edited at any time. Um, and they aren't really portable outside of the ecosystems defined by those companies, right? Um, uh, it's not really possible for me to present my st good standing as a member of Twitter for over 10 years uh, in a context outside of that in a way that uh, it doesn't notify Twitter and can't be taken away by Twitter, right? Um, and and that, that knowingness that issuers today have in the digital identity world is actually a big problem from a uh, privacy and surveillance point of view. The fact that Twitter knows everywhere that I log in with Twitter, Facebook knows everywhere, not just that I log in with Facebook, but if I'm logged into Facebook, if I go to a site that has the login with Facebook uh, uh, button, that sends a ping over to Facebook that I've gone and visited CNN or whatever. Um, and this, this is a big issue for a lot of people out there and one that we should be able to do better on. So, um, so in the digital world, how do we get closer to that? Well, let's break this down a little bit further as well into a little bit more detail. Um, there are three different aspects or even dimensions really to to identity to consider. Um, there are the relationships, the people you know. Um, I, I, you, you have a relationship with family, with your employer, um, with friends, with the government, right? Uh, that's, that's one dimension of this. There are attributes that are inherent to you or inherent to your experiences, things like where and when you were born, your, um, your credit history, your history of having paid things uh, in time or, or not, um, your healthcare records, your education. These are certainly not things you want to be public record, right? Uh, uh, these are things, in fact, you want to really know who you've shared that data with and things like GDPR and CCPA give us the chance to, to retract some of that when we uh, feel we have to. Um, but, uh, but those are attributes of, of who you are. Um, and then third, uh, we have agents out there um, who act on our behalf or, or should act on our behalf, uh, who we trust with aspects of our identity. You know, if you're buying a house, you trust your realtor to share information about you to a prospective uh, seller of the house that you want to buy. Uh, your lawyer uh, acts as an agent for you. Your um, And then technologically speaking, even your cloud services, your iPhone app act as an agent for you in, in many of these engagements around identity uh, in, in the digital world, for sure, and increasingly in the physical world. Think about when, I don't know if any of you have stored your um, uh, flight boarding pass in your Apple wallet, but you're starting to cross over between the digital and the real when you when you do that. Um, and then finally, I, 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 not to overstate the case that you are your data, you're much more than your data, I promise. But, um, I, but there are things inherent to you that 
that are intrinsic, right? Things like, uh, I, you know, um, uh, things like the knowledge you have about who knows what about me, about representation, who represents me, um, uh, and and also finally this sense of data leakage, um, uh, who can share what about me? I, I, you know, all these are are ways of understanding these these three dimensions. Um, uh, apologize for the noise in the background. Um, uh, so these three stages of, uh, so, so as things have evolved digitally, I, I, we've really seen three stages of digital identity. Um, the first two of which are very much centralized. One where you have an account, as I mentioned, with a central organization. And there are standards that have been built off of federating that or trying to federate that um, uh, and, and work have worked reasonably well for the scalability, at least of institutional trust. So things like the, the TLS standards in HTTP, which have really uh, done a lot to, to help us build a secure internet, really. Um, I, uh, going forward from that, uh, there are architectures for federating that even further and using third parties. Uh, and you've seen standards like uh, SAML and OpenID Connect and OAuth2, um, which is how we got to the login with Facebook, login with Twitter through an IDP, some sort of identity uh, provider, um, uh, to a third party uh, organization. And again, architecturally, the challenge with that uh, solution is just how much that puts power in the hands of the IDPs to not only issue or revoke those um, credentials but also uh, I, I know everywhere that you've, you've been uh, using those credentials. So the third concept is one where really there, there is a direct connection between you and the party that you're trying to, to, to prove things to or perhaps get issued uh, 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 credentials from and where underneath that is a common distributed ledger, a blockchain, a shared database of any sort um, that is uh, neutral, uh, that, that is independent of the two of you, uh, and that can serve as a backbone much the same way that the internet uh, serves as a backbone for communications that at this point we simply can take for granted. Uh, and and uh, again, kind of the actors in this in this uh, soap opera are issuers, credential holders, and verifiers. Um, and you could really take anybody who's active out there in this in this ecosystem and define them as these parties. They might even be uh, uh, simultaneously somebody could be a, a credential holder and a verifier, right? Um, I might hold a house party. Uh, and only want to allow people in who uh, have been vaccinated for a serious disease, for example, right? I should be able to verify directly with you rather than being an institution, right? Like uh, uh, that you have indeed received a vaccine for a certain, a certain disease. Um, uh, and so in this uh, identity ecosystem that we're trying to build, um, we take uh, that very simplified model and extend it one step further uh, to uh, talk about uh, uh, basically these actions and standards in between these different parties. Um, issuers both issue a credential to the credential holder, but then they also register a proof of that claim and their own integrity and provenance to this common registry, um, to a blockchain registry, distributed ledger, shared database, that sort of thing. The credential holder then, when they present that claim to the verifier, the verifier, it's basically a cryptographically signed document. And they can verify that that ownership came from the credential holder using standard public key cryptography. Um, uh, but then they can also verify uh, the integrity of that claim by validating the signatures uh, and, and the integrity of that doc, if it's actually been registered, um, into this common registry. Uh, and that's wildly simplified. There's a lot more cryptographically that lies underneath these, these concepts. Um, uh, this is really what started to emerge as self-sovereign identity or user-centric identity. That's where the term SSI uh, really comes from. Uh, but, but underneath what pulls it all together is a standard called the decentralized identifier, which is as fundamental to this new approach to building things as say the URL is to the way that the web uh, took off and grew. Um, and, and then really also fundamentally common is, is having a common place where these uh, um, uh, DIDs uh, exist and are expressed, which is a public blockchain or other decentralized network. Um, uh, and uh, I should add here that in between the issuer and credential holder, um, you can use zero knowledge proofs to help support the idea of selective disclosure uh, between the parties so that, you know, for example, a driver's license Think about all the biographic data that you have on that driver's license. Um, it's got your your birth date. It's got your weight, your your eye color. It's got your photo. Um, it has your home address, right? If you're going to a bar uh, and you need to prove that you're over the age of 21, 
you don't necessarily want all of the, that information to follow with uh, with that and be available to to the bar, right? The bar owner, if they had a full copy of all that data, you know, you, uh, I, I, you know, that would be a, a surveillance and privacy kind of disaster, right? So instead, there there are ways to use zero knowledge proofs and uh, this technology called verifiable credentials that has also emerged out of this ecosystem to present a subset of that data just enough to be able to prove to the bouncer at the door, to the bar owner, yes, I actually am who I am. Here's my face, my eye color, that sort of thing, but without having to share my birth date. In fact, it might even state I'm over the age of 21 without stating the year that I was I was born. So some really exciting stuff happening in that space. I think it's important to help uh, clarify what self-sovereign identity is not. Um, it's not a replacement for civil registries uh, like uh, birth registries, driver's, li driver's license authorities, passport offices. This is not about eliminating the need for these for those kinds of organizations, institutions, or, or functions. Um, this isn't a rip and replace for all existing identity schemes. Um, there are lots of s systems today that start centralized that this technology will be able to support uh, uh, those centralized parties becoming issuers of credentials on a decentralized network. Um, so it could be possible that at some future point, I'll prove I'm a Twitter user uh, for 10 years in good standing or with this many followers um, in the form of a verifiable credential that, that I could use to log into another site without Twitter ever knowing. But with that new site, being able to trust that that data is accurate and complete. So that's really cool. Um, it doesn't work for blocking folks either. It's not meant for no-fly lists or, or sanctions lists. Um, this is really about just proving positive things. Um, although in a distributed ledger that's assumed to be complete, the absence of say, I, you know, if I show that, hey, I've got a valid driver's license, right? And that's checked in the ledger. By checking in the ledger, one also can check uh, to see if there's ever been a recording of a revocation of that license. Say I have been arrested for DUI um, and lost my driver's license. The, 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 the DMV can issue a, a retraction or a re, uh, you know kind of a to pull back that license. And that can be seen by the bar owners. They can go, oh, okay, I've lost my driver's license. Um, I, uh, so that system, you know, if you build upon the, the sense that the blockchain ledger is complete for, for, for those purposes, and then they can see there has been no revocation. And, and that, that provides an extra layer of trust in the system. Um, uh, it, it also doesn't mean everybody self-attests all the information. This is not just about me claiming who I am and claiming I'm over 21 and I'm actually 19. All of this is about, about verifiable data, right? Um, and most importantly, it's not about removing the need for governments, um, nor is it uh, about expanding the role of governments. I want to be very clear. Right now, we tend to overload social security numbers and driver's licenses and other things for the purposes of identity or the purposes of credit checks and those sorts of things. And that's a dangerous trend, right? Uh, that's one where uh, uh, we see privacy breaches all the time. We see people's credit history ruined through credit fraud. Um, we can do this better. Uh, we sincerely can. And uh, I, that's not by casting government as the enemy, but by saying, are there ways to reduce the burden on government of the digital systems that we implement? And I think this is, this is a, a big key to that. Um, so self-sovereign ID inside Hyperledger has evolved uh, quite a bit. Um, I uh, originally, uh, so, so back at the very beginning of Hyperledger, we had one technology framework called uh, Fabric, I, uh, but it was pretty clear that Fabric had a, a certain point of view on how smart contracts should work, how consensus should work, uh, that was designed for, you know, a, a, not so much a set of use cases, but a deployment paradigm uh, that was not necessarily the, the, the one answer to everything in, in blockchain and distributed ledger. So we opened the door as an umbrella to other projects. And very quickly, um, a group stepped in from Evernim, uh, a startup company based out in Utah, uh, that um, actually some folks who I've known for 15 years in the digital identity space uh, played a role in starting. They uh, um, and Evernim said, we think there's something really here uh, in in this self-sovereign identity space. We're going to jump in. They wrote a, a a technology that became Hyperledger Indie, and that is software to run on a node of a distributed digital identity network. That that common layer for a blockchain um, uh, is what's implemented by Indie, and I'll actually go into that in a little bit. 
And, and that project took off. Uh, uh, it became the basis for a network uh, hosted by Sovereign, uh, the Sovereign Foundation. Uh, Sovereign is, I uh, think of them a little bit like ICANN um, in that they are a governance organization for a, a, a decentralized blockchain network. Um, I, I, and they, I, I, uh, there's a whole kind of story around Sovereign and where they are now, but they are still very much alive and serving as a, as a volunteer run uh, platform for uh, verifying digital credentials. And it's a, uh, uh, Really, it'll be interesting to see where they go. Um, and they've contributed quite a bit, as has Evernim, to the development of Indy, uh, uh, as have a number of other organizations, um, including government organizations, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then splitting out from Indy are two projects called Ursa and Ares that I'll talk about more in a bit. But Ursa is kind of a shared crypto library, and Ares is a collection of software for building peer-to-peer -peer connections and wallet messaging and key management um, that is essential to getting this vision to work. Um, so here's more of a, of a, of a, a structural or architectural kind of diagram for, for these things. Um, Ursa is intended to be kind of like our version of OpenSSL, right? Uh, to be something that uh, uh, other Hyperledger uh, applications plug into and, and beyond um, uh, to perform these kind of underlying functions. Um, Hyperledger Indie, kind of at the bottom, is the, the software to run on each node to serve up uh, this network. And then Ares are those layers that I mentioned um, built on top. Um, and there's more that we can go into, but I just want to keep things moving a bit briskly. In fact, uh, uh, Indy is uh, 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 you know, really best thought of as uh, uh, the toolkit to build these networks. Um, Sovereign is one kind of those networks. Um, there could be other networks. I know of uh, several that are in development now. Uh, I, I, and uh, we'll talk about some of the examples at the very end. Um, but Indy is that, that fundamental software that you need to run uh, to be able to make this whole thing uh, work and be worth doing. Um, Indy is uh, uh, hosted at, at Hyperledger, of course. Um, it uses Byzantine consensus between those nodes instead of proof of work. There is no token in this network. There's no need for a token, um, uh, at least fundamentally to make it operate. Um, it is based on the premise of radically trying to reduce the costs of both reads uh, and of writes. Um, costs should be free. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, reads should be absolutely free. It should cost nothing to verify the integrity of a credential I'm presenting. Um, in the same way that um, a, you know, reading a domain name uh, into an IP address uh, should be so cheap as to be not even worth metering, not even worth charging for, right? Um, and rights arguably should also be free. Um, blockchains of all sorts in, uh, have upper bounds on the number of rights per second that you can um, support to actually get to global consensus. There's a lot of work going on now to uh, figure out how to continue to reduce the amount of rights that are necessary to support a large numbers of credentials. Um, some really exciting stuff happening in that field, actually. Um, so I, uh, the goal as well is to try to bring the cost of rights to zero or as, as low as possible. Um, but still, there's usually some fundamental constraints involved there. So, so it's all a question of seeing what we can do and how quickly that can be converged. Um, and then finally, Indy is just about the software. It's not about the governance model. It's not about um, uh, 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 specifying who gets on or, or, or not or what the rules are. Um, uh, again, that's kind of the, the thing you want to leave to an organization like an ICANN uh, to, to decide independently for their cohort, for their network of um, identity providers. In fact, there is a, um, uh, uh, one of the follow-ups uh, in, the, in the Ask the Experts conversation. I'll post a link there to something called the Trust Over IP Foundation, which is really working to build those kinds of governance organizations organizations that will use Hyperledger Indy and, and Ares and other platforms to go and build uh, the complete uh, kind of identity ecosystem out there. I, I, so um, the things you can do with Indy are, are uh, I, I, you know, use it as a way to establish uh, channels between wallets, uh, use it to send and receive messages with high security and privacy, use it to prove things about yourself, to receive and validate proofs. Uh, and uh, and then create agents that proxy in uh, that into the cloud or to edge devices. Um, it really is about managing your own identity as well, although the presumption is that many people, especially consumers, will have custodial agents for their identity information Likely people like Apple and Google, but but hopefully a competitive marketplace uh, of people who can provide those kinds of custodial services for your identity credentials. Um, uh, and so Indy has also a client SDK that makes building these kinds of applications easier. 
Um, there are several instances out there. I'll go into a bit more depth on the Kiva one, um, but just in the interest of time, I, I want to move through the, the others. I mentioned Sovereign has both a live network and a test network up. Um, and then uh, there's one that was put together uh, by the government of British Columbia, uh, focused on an application called the Org Book, which is kind of the organizational equivalent of Facebook, um, but it's for digital identity for small and mid-sized businesses, actually, uh, which, is, which is pretty interesting to see. Uh, Hyperledger Ares is much more of a, of a client toolkit um, uh, designed for building wallets and uh, web interfaces that use and deal with identity information. It is really infrastructure for blockchain rooted peer to peer interactions. Um, I, and, I, I, and we see lots of wallets today that are building and using this technology. Um, and then it leverages Ursa, which I'll talk about in, in just a bit. Uh, so there's a, I, I actually, uh, I'll go into more depth on this at the uh, uh, along with Dave at the uh, Ask the Expert. I just want to kind of keep the, 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 the pace of this kind of brisk, but um, I, you, you have in, in uh, Aries uh, as well an encrypted messaging system for point-to-point -point communication between wallets. Again, just to help uh, uh, with the, the privacy and the integrity of these, of these transactions, right? A way to try to avoid um, uh, uh, having to go through a central party for, for, for any step of verification and even, even issuance. Uh, and frankly, it's Aries is about making digital identity systems more like human identity systems, um, more like back to that very uh, first set of slides I created. Uh, within Hyperledger, we treat these uh, as three distinct projects, and I'll talk about Ursa in a bit. Um, I, I, and there's a lot of overlap between the developers on each. They work very tightly together around common standards um, and the touch points that they all have to each other. I, I, there are also uh, uh, working groups that, that come into play here. In fact, there's an identity working group at Hyperledger, which covers the field pretty broadly and as it applies to all of our projects. But then looking outside of Hyperledger, what are the standards emerging? What are the big deployments, what are the um, you know, position papers people are writing about how identity should work. And then uh, uh, within Hyperledger, we have quite a few special interest groups focused on domains like healthcare and trade finance uh, and, um, and supply chain, social impact, public sector uses. Um, and we see identity seep in to pretty much every one of these use cases. And so um, there's been a lot of kind of communication between those groups and, and the, the technical communities on, on what we're building and, and, and why they might be value. Uh, uh, sorry for the repeat. Let me let me uh, uh, just skip ahead. Finally, to talk about Hyperledger Ursa. Ursa is a shared cryptographic library that makes it easier to avoid duplicating other cryptographic work, um, and hopefully along the way, increasing security in the process. Um, we've uh, I put this together uh, to to be uh, uh, something accessible to all the different projects at Hyperledger, uh, and uh, a place to collect together um, uh, kind of the the, the more challenging cryptographic work uh, around especially zero knowledge proofs uh, and, and other systems. Um, let me uh, show you how we would uh, do it wrong if we were to do it this way, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, it's always uh, uh, recommended against to build your own crypto library. Um, there are a lot of people who've gotten it very, very wrong out there. I don't have to cite the examples. Um, uh, it's hard work and it's something that uh, is very hard to do if each project decides to do it on their own. Um, and we're really eager to see uh, communities beyond Hyperledger look at adopting uh, this technology. So it's really to try to fight this kind of monoculture kind of concept um, I, and, and create something in a very developer-friendly uh, uh, kind of way, one that, that makes it hard to use it wrong. Um, that's a, a tall order, uh, but uh, we're going to do our best. Um, just to give you a snapshot of some of the, the, the actual interfaces and standards supported, um, there is a big focus on elliptic curve uh, cryptography. Um, on uh, uh, It does cover digital signatures, encryption schemes, key, key exchange. Um, uh, it is intended to be multi-platform. It is also intended to cover uh, multiple languages, although where stuff, new stuff is needing to be written, uh, uh, it's not, I think the preference of that community has been to write it in Rust. That does seem to be where the security conscious and performance sensitive uh, interests of our community tend to, to, tend to come together. Um, but we also know that there's a lot of usage of Go in the Hyperledger community and publicly, and 
and obviously languages like Python and, and others continue to be important. So um, definitely would love to, to see folks join that if they want to learn more. Um, we did also put together some training materials on uh, the Linux Foundation's uh, segment on edX around um, Hyperledger, Indy, Aries, and Ursa, just trying to understand that broadly. Um, uh, enrollment is, is open, and I believe the course has launched. Um, <clears throat> I want to end with some use cases, and then I'll dive into questions. Uh, so I, I, the, I did mention this before, uh, but the government of British Columbia established a, um, a network for verifiable credentials for small and mid-sized businesses in, in the state, uh, in the province of British Columbia to be able to use to manage their engagements with government agencies. <clears throat> if any of you have ever started a business, uh, you know that you have uh, uh, dealings with both like local governments, like city government, et cetera. You might have a dealing with a state government and you might, or a province government, and you might have a dealing with a national government. And if you do business across borders, which increasingly everybody is, you're probably doing that with multiple jurisdictions, right? Um, so, uh, you know, weaving together the, the, the official documents you get and the permits you get across all of these organizations is really hard if you're going to wait for all of them to tie their back end systems together to give you one pane of glass, right? That's never going to happen. Um, uh, and so instead, uh, uh, the use of self-sovereign identity allows you to say, okay, I will get a business registration from the state of California. I will open my restaurant in, in San Francisco and so engage with the city of San Francisco. I will pay my federal taxes to the U.S. government. I will get a right to serve alcohol from the from the county of San Francisco. I will get, you know, like allows me to serve as the pivot point for all of these engagements and use hey, my business credential issued by the state when I'm applying for, you know, the ability to open a restaurant. You know, this the city authorities need to verify the integrity of those state issued credentials, right? So in the far off future, all of this becomes uh, me serving as that pivot point for proof of identity and everybody verifying the integrity of these documents uh, very cheaply and quickly, right? Um, that's the vision that the this group inside the government of British Columbia have been pursuing. And to make things easier, uh, they introduced uh, a degree of centralization, which uh, the long-term goal is to kind of tease that apart as well. But it's something called the org book, which is this network of verifiable data around these different uh, organizations uh, using these underlying technologies, ND and verifiable credentials and DIDs, to be able to make that that uh, the, the exchange of that information easier to cut down on fraud from from counterfeit IDs um, to make bureaucratic processes much, much quicker, right? To get away from using the fax machine or, or notaries uh, or other services that today we overly depend upon because we don't know how to trust digital data, right? Um, so this is a big deal. And, and this is growing quickly and getting a lot of accolades and recognition from other governments who are starting to go, well, maybe we should reform how we deal with digital identity in a similar way. I, I, another example of this is a, a, a group called Kiva. Uh, uh, Akiva is a, um, a for-profit company that uh, uh, has, was one of the first to really pioneer this uh, concept of microloans, um, especially international and consumer-driven microloans. You know, find a, um, a woman's owned uh, textile factory in, in uh, Indonesia who is trying to raise $500, and so I can put $50 in and convince nine friends to put $50 more dollars in and, and we can help them buy the new uh, machine that they need for their factory, right? Um, so Kiva now operates in, in many, many countries and they found as they've expanded that they needed to help those countries uh, uh, improve their own ability to um, uh, manage uh, risk and manage credit bureaus and credit histories uh, so that people who actually do pay their loans back on time uh, are able to get better terms for the next loan that they take out and the next loan they take out. Uh, otherwise, lending rates to account for for people who don't pay back because there's no penalty for, for defaulting, um, loan rates are like 30%, which is just like too high to pay for uh, for most startup companies, most uh, businesses to have access to capital. So they're doing a project with the government of Sierra Leone uh, to implement a digital identity system for Sierra Leone that is based on self-sovereign ID 
that is based on these technologies we've talked about, a mix of Hyperledger Indie and actually a bit of Fabric as well, um, uh, to go and implement for uh, not just not just uh, credentials for the um, for all citizens that could be used for any purpose, financial or healthcare related, education related, those sorts of things, um, but but specifically to use it to implement a, a privacy first uh, credit bureau system. One that doesn't work the way it does in the States where three agencies know everything about the payments you make on time, but instead where your history is something you own and you can decide to share with uh, a, a, um, a lender or somebody you're applying to for a loan on a very selective basis, but in a way that allows them to make sure that the that record is truthful and that it's complete. I haven't decided to just remove the items that um, were embarrassing to me, the times I didn't pay my, my bills on time, right? Um, so uh, that's a really interesting development, and Kiva is really stepping forward here, but they're working with uh, uh, several agencies of the United Nations, along with obviously the Sierra Leone government, uh, to, to implement this. Uh, and that approach actually has also received certification from ID2020, which is uh, an organization certifying digital identity projects as being uh, respectful of civil rights and, 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 and uh, liberties. Uh, so some really exciting stuff. Uh, there's some other projects out there, something called ID Chain coming out of BYU uh, that uh, is getting some some traction in the uh, academic uh, world around using these systems to track academic credentials, not just your diploma, but your progress against uh, all sorts of different academic uh, 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 targets. Um, I, I think of it as your record, uh, but within your control uh, in, in terms of who that gets shared with, um, in terms of uh, being able to verify the integrity of credentials presented to you if you are hiring, for example, um, uh, and try to move to just a more privacy first kind of point of view with that. Uh, and then finally, I'll mention CU Ledger, which is an attempt <clears throat> to somewhat provide the same kind of credit bureau reform uh, in the United States uh, that uh, has been seen by um, uh, that, that the Kiva project is attempting in Sierra Leone. And CU Ledger uh, is a project of, uh, of a credit bureau collaborative, um, credit bureaus, uh, credit unions, sorry, credit union collaboratives. Credit unions are kind of the, uh, um, the, the more beneficent and community-minded alternatives to many of the um, standard banks that you see out there. Uh, and so it makes sense that they're very focused on working together, but also working on behalf and uh, in the interests of their customers uh, and, and giving them uh, uh, some special powers they might not have had before. Uh, so uh, that's all super exciting. And um, one hour or 40 minutes or however much you have is uh, way too short to go into the kind of depth that this requires uh, to, to answer everyone's questions. But um, I'm going to take an attempt to answer uh, some for the next 10 minutes. Uh, and then I'll jump over to Slack and join uh, Dave Hughesby, uh, who might already even be there on, on the Ask the Experts uh, B channel to answer your questions. Um, but I see one question here um, from <clears throat> Ivan Perez, uh, who asks, "Does governments uh, do are governments willing to move to this technology as issuers, especially with zero knowledge enabled?" Um, it's a really good question. Governments uh, are are used to having a role where they are um, uh, omniscient about what happens right um, in the digital systems that they deploy. Uh, um, some governments are better about this than others. Um, you know, I I, I, I want to be sensitive and diplomatic here. So, uh, you know, there's some governments who, uh, uh, or some countries, let me put it this way, because it's also about the citizens in those countries. Some citizens and governments who are happy with their governments knowing a lot about um, uh, about them out of a sense of safety that that provides, uh, or a sense that uh, sharing that information is uh, better for, for harmony um, or co social cohesion. And others who don't trust their governments at all uh, and, um, and for good reasons reason, right? Uh, and, you know, this approach doesn't dictate, uh, you know, one thing or another. Um, it allows people to share information with whoever they'd like to. Um, it allows, obviously, governments, when they issue credentials or, you know, uh, annotate that with additional information, they always can keep that information. What was important, though, was to come up with an architecture that uh, we believe that started from the premise that the issuer of my credentials shouldn't have control over where and how I use those credentials afterward. And control meaning they shouldn't be able to take that away, pretend it never existed. They may be able to issue an update that says that credential that we issued is no longer valid because that diploma that I earned um, turned out was fraudulent. Turns out I paid off my last couple professors and didn't really earn it, right? So um, so that's, that's a, I, 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 you have to be able to support that. 
But then, you know, if I'm presenting my diploma to somebody, they can see both the diploma and the retraction. And that's more data, that's better data than if the diploma just disappeared because the academic institution went away or the website went down uh, or they forgot about me, right? So governments are starting to warm up to this. And governments for the last 10 years have been deploying um, identity systems that are starting out as centralized. Um, perhaps the most successful example of this is uh, in India, um, something called the uh, Aadhaar, which is a, a, a centralized digital identity system for the Indian subcontinent. Um, and it's uh, something that now 1 billion out of the 1.2 billion uh, Indian citizens have an Aadhaar ID, I believe it is, but it might even be more complete than that. Um, and there's a whole India stack now being built on top of that number. Um, you have to respect the fact that um, that platform does seem to have uh, brought some social benefits uh, when it comes to making sure people get access to um, <clears throat> healthcare, get access to uh, rations when they need it and, and other, other benefits. Uh, but, uh, but there have also been some clear concerns about civil liberties and privacy, even by courts inside of India. So um, governments are still figuring this out and governments, especially in Europe, uh, especially Canada, um, uh, especially in other places where there's a strong tradition of privacy as a right baked into their constitutions um, or laws like GDPR are really eager to understand um, technology architectures that make that possible because all they've heard so far have been I, I, I just let, leave it up to us. We'll build a big central server out of this. Uh, so it's been really great to see experiments like the one I mentioned in Canada and Sierra Leone. Um, there are quite a few uh, developments in Europe, uh, in Finland, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, in Spain. Um, that are happening at both national and kind of city levels. Um, uh, but I think in order for this to be interesting, we have to see adoption by the private sector, by nonprofits, by others, uh, and make sure government isn't crit isn't uh, 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 the platform, right? Government uh, should be a peer. They should be a participate in this, just as any government can set up a website now. Um, but uh, fundamentally, this network doesn't really need government to operate. Uh, uh, and 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 it can ho ho hopefully take the burden off of government institutions from having to do things they don't really need to do. Um, uh, and still, meanwhile, leave all of the appropriate kind of functions like issuing driver's licenses and uh, social security cards and that sort of thing um, uh, and proper regulatory functions to government as well. Um, uh, but this is, it's, uh, and I've seen eyes light up. I haven't seen anybody in government firmly opposed to this kind of approach. Uh, I, I, it just sometimes you have to help governments understand that the when they've taken a very centralized path um, why that might be limiting to their potential future sorry I went off for about 15 minutes on one question <laughs> but it's it's obviously one of my favorite questions in this and it does motivate a lot of why we're involved um, uh, uh, and it's I uh, really super want to emphasize government has it can be a partner in this and, uh, um, and it gives them some real advantages over a centralized approach I'm looking for other uh, um, questions that might emerge. I'm looking on the chat here <clears throat> and not seeing them. Uh, let's see. I think if we're wrapped up, um, this is probably a good place to wrap up. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dave Hughesby and I will be on Slack on the Ask the Experts Channel B, um, and I'll jump over there to, to look at it. Uh, other than that, um, thank you for coming to the talk, and I look forward to engaging all of you on this um, as, as time allows. Thank you. <laughs>